Good morning and welcome to Teledyne ISCO's Improving Prep HPLC webinar. Uh, today, Josh Lovell, our application specialist, will be taking you through how to get the most from your preparative HPLC equipment. So I will hand it over to Josh. If you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please use the chat function within the app and send to the host and presenter. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Um, look forward to talking to you guys about how uh, you guys can improve your prep HPLC experience and some things to think about when you guys are planning your experiments and separations to get the most from them. Um, I'm going to talk about today uh, a couple different aspects. So one of the focuses I'm going to discuss how injection efficiency plays a role in your uh, prep HPLC experience, how to maximize that. Uh, we're going to compare different loading methods and where you may, why you may choose one over the other and advantages and disadvantages of each method. Um, considerations for maximizing your sample recovery. So we'll talk about where sample can be lost in the uh, experiment uh, and how to minimize this. Uh, we're also going to discuss sample loop loading size and share some uh, results that we've found that kind of um, contradict some literature data uh, as guidance for, for sample loop loading. And then finally, we're going to discuss how uh, solvent loading choice can affect the loading capacity and chromatographic integrity of the separation. Um, so what is injection efficiency? And what we re refer to as injection efficiency, basically what it's accounting for is the amount of sample left behind after the injection. Uh, so this would be sample that is uh, residually left behind in your vial. Uh, this is a couple vials after evaporation of the residual liquid that um, clung to the side of the vial and was just down in the base of the vial that didn't get pulled into the sample probe. Um, basically, this is recoverable, unpurified sample, and this would negatively skew your sample recovery if you don't account for it. Um, we do want to try to maximize our injection efficiency, though, uh, from a throughput pr perspective and to increase the efficiency so we don't need to uh, run additional um, runs to just to do, to do the, the final wash. Um, potential causes of this is if you have a large diameter injection probe, uh, you can see here uh, as an example, we have our auto sampler probe tip, which is a wider um, uh, plastic uh, probe um, with a smaller capillary tube inside of it. So more liquid can cling to that. Uh, if you look at our auto injector probe tip, it's a thinner metal uh, probe. And each of these has their advantages and disadvantages. Um, but essentially, you know, the other thing is if the probe's not reaching, reaching the bottom of the sample vial, uh, so you're not getting that last bit of sample from the bottom. Also, any evaporation during the runs, uh, you can get uh, solvent that evaporates and basically forms a ring around the vial, and you get precipitation of the solid above the solvent line. And then you have finally sample clinging to the probe. So what are some ways that we can improve our injection efficiency? And one of the ways that we do that is we, we've des, uh, designed the AccuPrep to use high recovery vials. Uh, and these traditionally have a conical bottom, and you can find these with your um, scientific glassware providers. Um, also, you could use, you know, if you're using a smaller test tube uh, that has a rounded bottom, you can get pretty good recovery with that. But if you're using a flat bottom vial, then you're, you're going to lose some efficiency just because you're not going to be able to pull the uh, final amount of the, the liquid into the um, injector. Uh, so some, you know, a, a way you can, you can deal with this if you're doing multiple runs is you can combine that uh, last wash with uh, um, future samples to be run, and that way you're not losing sample. Um, so that's the obvious, obvious way. Another way you can uh, mitigate this is to, after the final injection, you wash the probe and vial with an additional aliquot of your injection solvent, uh, and basically do one last run on the instrument, and then um, you're not losing any, any sample to 
the 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 vial, <laughs> the vial sorry. Um, and finally, you do want to make sure if when you're using these probes that you want to make sure they're clean to avoid cross contamination and any um, spoiling of your sample. Uh, on the AccuPrep with an auto injector, this is an instructed sequence and basically tells you to put the probe into a wash solvent and then it'll run some solvent through the system. And then it'll put, uh, ask you to put it into a weak uh, solvent to go ahead and remove the strong solvent from the injector for the next injection. Uh, with our auto sampler module, uh, this is actually a fully automated process uh, where the sample probe gets washed uh, at the end of all the, uh, the entire sequence of runs uh, for that sample. Um, we flush, through, flush the injector and the probe uh, to, to clean it and, and wash it. Uh, so that makes it easier for, for you to avoid cross-contamination. Um, Additionally, one last step you can do is on the AccuPrep with the auto injector, auto sampler, as you can set up a, an extra, when you set up a series of injections, uh, if you add an additional run at the end, um, so say you program uh, a sequence of injections, 10 one milliliter injections, but if you only dissolve your sample in nine milliliters, uh, and then you basically, the last injection is just a wash with one mil, and then it goes, up, goes ahead and does the injection for you with that last one milliliter, which is going to be your wash, washed probe and whatever was residing in the vial still so that you can maximize recovery. Um, basically, you can get your injection efficiency up to 99% using doing this method. Um, before doing this method with the auto sampler, you get up to 92% injection efficiency. If you do that final wash, that bumps it up to 99. And the auto injector with the smaller metal probe, uh, thinner diameter metal probe, uh, can get you injection efficiency of around 99% without a wash step. So um, it's important because your sample is getting to your, your column being purified. Um, the next topic, topic of discussion is how or what's the best technique for loading my sample. Uh, so obviously manual injection is an option on all systems. Uh, with the AccuPrep, we have a lure adapter port. Uh, the limitations of this is that you need to flush the port after injection to ensure that all your sample enters the sample loop. We also offer a blunt needle syringe port. This is useful for method development on the analytical scale or sample loss needs to be mitigated, and there's no need to flush the injection port uh, because it's getting uh, injected directly at the, the point of the uh, injection valve. A uh, limitation of this, though, especially on the prep scale, is that the needle gauge, uh, 22 gauge, limits your injection speed. And then if you're doing a, law, uh, a large sample size of uh, multiple milliliters, it's going to take a lot longer time to inject that uh, into the sample loop. The problem with both of these uh, and this this uh, follows kind of the general belief, general belief in the uh, that you can't shouldn't exceed 50% of the loop size uh, using this method either of these methods uh, no matter the the loop volume and that, that's due to user variation experience uh, so if you're getting different injection speeds maybe you're introducing um, you know your valve timings off when you uh, with your um, manual injection so you want to make sure that you don't exceed 50% of the loop. And we'll discuss that a little, in a little bit more detail later. And obviously, since you're, you're manually doing this method each time, it leads to inferior repro reproducibility uh, and technique to the auto injector or auto sampler module. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and discuss our auto sampler and auto injector uh, modules that can help uh, improve your reproducibility. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss our auto injector and the advantage of it, advantages of it. And our auto injector basically allows multiple injections, a series of injections without any user feedback. Um, and since this is an automated process, uh, you're getting consistent uh, injection speed and, and um, and uh, Lord, synchronization, sorry, uh, with the valve timings for the instrument. Uh, this is going to improve your peak shape and your separation. Uh, it offers reproducibility. We can do injection volumes down to 10 microliters. 
the limitations of the auto injector only though is you can only do one sample at a time. So uh, you can't queue up a variety of different samples. You can queue up a, a series of injections on the same sample, but uh, if you were to switch samples, you would need to manually change that and also undergo the um, the wash sequence. Uh, you can only do one injection volume for series of runs, so you're not able to currently set up um, different injection volumes. Uh, if you were to try to maybe see how much you could your loading capacity on the column with different volumes. Um, and finally, there's a inst instructed uh, automated wash sequence that requires user action because you need to move the probe uh, from different uh, different solvents. The auto sampler, on the other hand, has the same advantages as the auto injector, um, but it also offers the ability to queue up multiple different samples. So you can queue up, um, depending on your, your rack size, um, up to 20, I believe, uh, 20 or more uh, samples. So you could have different samples and set up a queue of injections for each one. Uh, you can change the injection volume and create a different series that injects from the same sample. Uh, so you can set up a run that goes uh, 10, milliliter, 10 microliter injection and then 100 microliter injection, uh, so on and so forth, um, to the same sample, and it automatically go through that entire sequence. Um, additionally, you can create a di different methods if you're evaluating different gradients to see which is going to give you the best purification. Um, in the, in the same way. Uh, the auto sampler offers a feature also that um, is, is of uh, great use. It's called the scouting pause. Uh, and this allows you to basically set up a queue of runs, but not, but keep the um, instrument from proceeding to the, the next injection without getting approval from you. And then you can go ahead and cancel that scouting pause. Uh, once you've optimized your conditions. So this is a really good way you can set up a, a sample, put the scouting pause on, and do a run, confirm the results are, are satisfactory, and then go ahead and proceed with the rest of the queue without uh, in interaction from the user. Or you can go ahead and modify the conditions if you find that you need to optimize the conditions further and then do another scouting pause and make sure that the changes you made actually benefited the chromatography. Uh, additionally, it's completely automated wash process for the auto sampler. So uh, when you are using the auto sampler, you don't need to have any input to change, um, you know, change solvents or anything. It'll go to the wash station and, and wash the sample probe and the injector and the sample loop um, all automatically. So you don't have to worry about being there during the process. And our auto sampler does offer additional fraction collection, collection capacity, so it adds two more, ra uh, two more racks um, of fraction co collection capacity to the AccuPrep. So the next uh, topic, and probably most important, is how can I maximize sample recovery? So, to maximize sample recovery, first to understand the factors affecting the sample recovery. Uh, you know, where are we losing, where are we potentially losing sample, and how can we, uh, you know, prevent that? Um, and so these are kind of the questions that you need to ask yourself. And this is true for any prep HPLC system. Is, is the system set up properly? Um, what detection methods being used? You know, is that optimal for my compound? Um, you know, do I have the the strongest uh, wavelengths selected and or is my compound weakly or strongly UV active? Uh, if I'm using an alternative technique, is it a destructive technique like ELSD or mass spec? And if so, how much sample am I losing to detection? And how am I injecting my sample, which we discussed before? How much am I loading? Uh, how much is lost in the injection process? And what solvent is the sample being dissolved with and injected with? And ultimately, the question you want to ask there is that the solvent, it may be best for di dissolution of your sample. You get really, really good dissolution, but how does it affect the integrity of the chromatography? And so we'll discuss that uh, in depth. So proper system setup. 
the key for almost all these systems is you need an accurate measurement of the delay volume from the detector to the fraction collection valve. Uh, for many systems, this is measured upon system setup uh, and is input as part of the instrument or method startup or setup. Um, a lot of systems, this is an external tube that potentially could be uh, changed or altered uh, outside the instrument. Uh, in the ACCUPREP, this is all inside the instrument, so you, you can't uh, remove the tube and then replace it with uh, some other type of uh, tubing, the wrong size, and that would affect your delay volume. Uh, if this number is incorrect, it'll trigger fraction collection to begin and begin and end early or end and begin late. And obviously, that's a bad thing uh, when you're trying to recover your sample. Uh, the delay volume is already pre-programmed in AccuPrep's peak track software. Uh, the default method and detection settings on the AccuPrep with automation using an auto sampler um, or auto injector offer greater than 92% sample recovery, and that's without any optimization of the um, detection. Uh, this would be just the default method that you loaded your sample and let the AccuPrep do its work, and you, you should have greater than 92% recovery. Other ways you can maximize the sample recovery, so these are things to consider for your unique compounds uh, and applications, is maybe you want to collect all fractions. Uh, that way you re recover your fraction. It may not be separated, um, fractionated completely, but you do recover any impure sample maybe, um, and you don't lose any sample, accidentally lose sample to waste. Uh, you can optimize your detector setting, detection settings, and with the AccuPrep, you can choose to collect all fractions, but you can still choose detection settings to trigger the transition to the next tube, so then you can still get the isolated fractions. And you can do this in the method editor menu, uh, choose collect all fractions. Uh, you can also choose to collect all fractions from the, the home screen while the run's going. You can choose collect just peaks only, none, or all. on all on the screen while the run's running. Uh, additionally, you could set up time windows. Uh, so time windows uh, may offer an alternative to collecting all and minimizing some of the volume. So if you know that you know the first five minutes of your, your run is, is there's no compound coming off, uh, basically we can send that all to waste and then we can collect um, the fractions after that and then we can also trigger uh, fraction collection based on the, de the detection settings uh, also within that time within, within those time windows and then we can optimize our detector settings which we'll just talk, talk about here so how can optimizing my detector improve sample recovery and so optimizing the UV settings for maximized recovery um, is really important because it's unique to your compound and so deviation from the optimal wavelength for, for a compound can significantly impact the detection. So if, if you're off by a few wavelengths and you're uh, to, the, to the right or the left of the, the peak wavelength, uh, you're not getting maximum, maximum detection. You're going to be losing um, some of your detection ability. And that's going to, that's going to end up impacting your fraction collection uh, when that triggers and ultimately your sample recovery. Um, Finding the optimal wavelength for detection of your compound is really important in maximizing sample recovery. And so you can do that. You can, if you have previous UV spectral data on your compounds, that's always helpful. Um, you need to be aware of the solvent and the solvatochromatic effects due to the gradient. So depending on where your compound comes out in the gradient, you know, if that's more towards, um, you know, 10% uh, organic versus 100% organic, uh, that can have significant effects on the um, the max or the optimal wavelength, uh, depending on where it's at in the gradient. Uh, one way you can really improve and optimize your uh, sample recovery using the AccuPrep software um, is you can obtain the UV vis spectral data from a small scale scouting run using the AccuPrep. So the AccuPrep has taken an entire UV uh, or UV vis spectra, depending on which detector you have. Um, and if you go to the where the peak eludes, it'll go ahead and 
and show you the, the wavelength for that, um, for that compound in that solvent uh, of the gradient elution, so when it's passing, passing through the, the flow cell. Uh, this is really useful data for you, because um, then you can see the optimal wavelength. You can see if you're monitoring at the optimal wavelength of that, in the gradient, and you can use that for future runs and scale-ups to really optimize your sample recovery. Um, additionally, uh, this minimizes the solvatochromatic effect uh, when using a gradient elution as the compound's already under similar solvent conditions as future runs because where it's coming out at, it's going to be similar in the gradient. Additional ways we can optimize sample, sample recovery is in the method editor. We can adjust the threshold or um, the slope-based fraction collect collection trigger settings um, in the AccuPrep software. You could monitor multiple single wavelengths, so we could set up one at 254 or, and then another at 280 or whatever you choose as long as it's in the, the range of your detector, depending if you have UV or UV vis. Uh, you can also choose just to monitor it. Uh, you can trigger off either one, but you could also monitor it. Uh, you could also take advantage of a feature we call all wavelength detection. And what this does is it measures the average absorbance over a, wave of, a range of wavelengths. And this is really useful for closely eluding compounds with overlapping similar UV data. Um, and this can also be useful to help um, some, some weaker absorbing compounds um, improving their detection because you're looking at a, a range of wavelengths versus just a single wavelength. Additionally, the, uh, you know, with, with a lot of systems, you guys can, you can choose to use an alternative detector or secondary detection method. Uh, one, of the, one of those common methods is using the ELSD. Um, a lot of times this is a standalone, a standalone module on the system. Uh, this is fully integrated into the AccuPrep, and it's ideal for non-volatile compounds. And you do lose a, a, some sample destroyed by the uh, some samples destroyed by the process. It's a destructive uh, technique. And some of the optimization settings, you can change the sensitivity. Uh, you can adjust the the gain and um, maximize or change the temperature settings to optimize your um, ELSD method. And so, like I said before, the AccuPrep actually offers an integrated ELSD module that, that fits within the system and that's fully integrated uh, with the PeakTrack software to compensate for, uh, for delay between the ELSD and the UV and to optimize fraction collection based upon um, both the UV and the ELSD peak uh, detection. Additionally, uh, mass spec is a really useful technique to couple with PrEP HPLC. Uh, you can trigger fractionation based upon the mass detected. Uh, and like ELSD, you're losing some sample uh, to the mass spec in the process. So it's a destru destructive technique. Um, there's a couple choices and, you know, probe choice and for doing ESI versus APCI for your mass spec. You can also vary the ionization settings within the peak track software. Uh, we offer uh, integration with the pure ion mass spec for uh, data collection, fraction, fraction collection, and also you can use the, the mass spec independently uh, through the peak track software to um, look at crude samples or pure samples and look at the mass so that you can do method development to, to develop your method for mass triggered fractionation. Um, additionally, we have uh, allow interaction with other external detectors um, that aren't um, manufactured by Teledynasco. Um, we've successfully set up some radio activity detectors for radiochemical applications with the AccuPrep, um, and at the Peak Track software offers an easy way for external detectors to easily interface with the peak track software to trigger fraction collection. So the next topic uh, I'm going to discuss here is uh, sample loop size and basically how much I can load into a sample loop uh, depending on the size. And so this is going to be based upon some um, 
some literature um, guidelines that, that have been previously uh, published, and then also some of our in-house experiments to um, support both of the, these different literature claims. So there's basically uh, two major pieces of literature that um, from two different valve manufacturers that kind of uh, contradict each other a little bit. Um, and so I'm going to describe what the past literature kind of says in, in regards to sample loading guidelines. And so depending on the, um, the specific technique, there's a couple of different outcomes uh, depending on the technique you chose. So one common injection valve manufacturer suggests uh, to fill the loop to no more than half its volume when doing partial loop injection. And this is in order to maintain precision and, vo and avoid sample loss. And this seems to have been a, um, um, a common rule of thumb that we've heard from, from numerous customers is, you know, am I limited to half the sample loop size or can I do more? Um, and the basis for this uh, is that there's a laminar flow effect uh, when loading the sample loop. And essentially, the sample has a parabolic velocity profile. And the velocity at the center of the tube is about twice the average, twice the velocity of the uh, average, as the velocity at the wall is around zero. And so you can see on this uh, this image here, uh, the velocity profile in pipes. You have two kinds of flow. Uh, there's laminar flow and turbulent flow. And without getting into the details, laminar flow um, is what we predominantly see in uh, HPLC particularly at the, the smaller uh, tube diameters. Um, this laminar flow profile, so you can see the, um, let's see here. You can see the, the velocity at the wall here, and then you can see the velocity at the center. So there's a, there's, the average is about halfway in between that. So when we, um, when we're flowing through the sample loop, once we get to over 50%, now we're starting to lose some of the front through the um, outlet of the sample loop, and that's going to waste. And so that's definitely a negative effect um, for prep HPLC and, and, and our outcomes. Um, the exact laminar flow pro profile is dependent on the loop geometry. So a, a lot of times, um, one of the, the biggest contributors is going to be the diameter of the loop and the loading flow rate. And so that's why the I'll discuss them a little bit, but that's why the auto sample and auto injector with the reproducible sample flow rates are so important to um, having a consistent flow profile. Oops. So ultimately, the laminar flow causes three regions of injection variation, and the first is the uh, partial filling region, and in, in this region, volumetric precision is determined by the syringe. And so, say we have a uh, we have a um, let's see, this is a hundred mi or fifty microliter loop. Sorry, um, in the injection region from zero to about twenty microliters, uh, we have a very linear profile, and, and that's um, shown in the Oh, sorry, this is a 20 microliter loop, sorry. So from zero to 10 microliters, this is a uh, linear profile. And then from 10 to 20, you see a deviation from the, the slope there. And so that's the second region. And this region, the sample fluid front begins to dilute and exits the sample loop while loading. And this is going to give you poor reproducibility and inferior performance, uh, and ultimately in prep HPLC sample loss. And then finally, the complete filling region, and this is at the analytical level, you overfill your loop three to five times, um, and this is going to give you basically a injection volume that's uh, determined by your sample loop. And this gives you very good uh, relative standard deviation of about 0.1%, uh, but you're going to lose significant amounts of sample on the prep scale if you follow this method uh, as you're send sending three to five times the sample loop size, you're going to be losing uh, two to four times of your sample. Uh, 
On the other hand, a competing valve manufacturer suggests the loading technique to eliminate this flow, laminar flow profile, and thus you can increase your sample loop loading. Uh, and what the literature suggests was that mixing can be prevented if there's a small air bubble preceding the sample fluid, and this segregates the sample plug from the mobile phase and prevents mixing. Laminar flow is only, only occurs if mixing is allowed to occur in the loop. So if we prevent that mixing, then uh, they suggest that we can avoid this laminar flow profile and increase the injection or the loading capacity of the sample loop. Uh, ultimately, though, the authors note that the precision and accuracy of the partial loop loading style are still functions of the operator in the syringe. So if we are doing manual injection, we're still introducing potential problems due to operator experience, uh, the syringe uh, calibration, um, and operator error. Uh, but ultimately, by cushioning the, the sample with air bubbles, you can increase the range of linearity of the partial filling region of the loop size. And this has been independently verified on the other valve manufacturer's valve um, in, by an outside outside group. Um, some common so how does the AccuPrep uh, take these issues and address the sample loop loading volume? So what we did is we, we went ahead and we did some ex experiments with the uh, auto sampler and the AccuPrep. Um, and the reason we did this is we, we based on what the manufacturers both indicated in the literature is that they both agreed that precision and accuracy of partial loop loading are still functions of the operator in its range. So we wanted to minimize the effect of operator variation um, by having a reproducible, consistent method of injection. And so we decided to use our auto sampler module with an auto injector um, that offers automated, consistent method for injection. This controls the flow rate from loading from run to run. Uh, and also consistent synchronized valve uh, switching. This eliminates errors due to operator handling or variation. And our auto, auto sampler module also takes us a step further. It incorporates a series of steps that isolates the sample fluid plug uh, with air pockets. And then, so that's how the uh, sample loop loading volume, uh, some general guidelines for the AccuPrep. I'm going to go into some specifics um, on different loop sizes because we did find some variability depending on the loop size. And to, um, one of those variations was kind of more on an analytical scale. So we wanted to ask the question is, can I run analytical scale on the AccuPrep? And with the auto sampler and auto injector, we found that we could. Uh, do minimum injection volumes of, of down to 10 microliters. Um, and this gives us good linearity from 10 to 50 microliters. And you can see the linearity data there um, for the two different peaks we were um, purifying. And this is on a 100 microliter loop. And relative standard deviation, you can see here that when we're in the um, 10 microliter region, we're 6 to 8% relative standard deviation. Uh, at 20 microliters, 3 to 5, and then at 50% the loop size, we're at our minimum at 2 to 4%. You can see the graph on the right there shows the relative standard deviation as we go towards 100 microliters increases greatly up to about 15%. And if you were to see the extended linearity curve, you would see a similar curve to what we showed earlier where we were entering the partial filling region. Um, and deviation from the slope um, that we see from uh, 10 to 50 microliters here. This is great for method development because you can easily put a 4.6 uh, C8 millimeter C18 column on the AccuPrep. Um, and if you're using the column select valve, uh, you can set up you know, a 4.6, a 20 millimeter, and then a 50 millimeter column all on the same system and have it all set up and go from column to column. Um, as your scale uh, necessitates. But you can do your scouting runs to the 4.6 column and easily translate those methods to larger columns. 
Uh, so you can do limit the sample needed for the runs. If you're doing it on 4.6, you can get optimized chromatic graphic uh, methods, and this eliminates the need for an alternative HPLC if you're you don't have access to it or uh, it's cost prohibitive to you. Uh, the only uh, nuance that's important to kind of remember when scaling up from a 4.6 millimeter column in the active prep is that there's a lot of um, dead time at higher flow rates if you were to directly scale a method from the 4.6. And that's because there's so much dwell volume. Because uh, there's, can, we optimize the active prep via prep system, but at the 4.6, there's, there's a significant amount of dwell volume that's um, uh, basically extending your run unnecessarily at higher flow rates if you were to go scale up to a larger column uh, from the 4.6 millimeter column. So with that, uh, so we were able to have successful or success using 100 microliter and 1 milliliter loops on the AccuPrep. Um, the loops we were using were 1 16th inch diameter, outside diameter, diameter throughout. Uh, these were really good for small loading volumes. Uh, gave us a uh, good peak shape uh, on the AccuPrep. And using the 4.6 millimeter column, we were able to go down to 10 microliter injections um, of a uh, one milligram per milli 0.1 milligram per milliliter sample. Uh, and you could do a 10 mil microliter injection on a uh, larger column, but you would probably need a more concentrated sample. Uh, what we found also is that, you know, if you're doing a 4.6 millimeter column, you want the smaller loop because the sample loop is just going to increase that dwell volume. Um, so if I had a 5 mil loop on there, I'd probably want to change that out to a 100 microliter or 1 milliliter loop. Um, that way I don't, I minimize five minutes worth of dead time uh, in the run as the gradient goes through the sample loop. And well, like, like I said before, we found that we can't load above 50% the loop size uh, using the 100 microliter or 1 milliliter loops. Um, so we have good linearity up to about 50, 60 microliters, and then um, the linearity seems to go away until we start to overfill the loop, and then we start to gain some linearity um, at about 400 microliters. So those are the three regions we just discussed before. Now, when we did this on the five milliliter and larger loops, we found something different. So, so on the prep scale, uh, these loops, they actually transition from a 1 16th outside diameter to a 1 8th inch loop um, in order to minimize the length of the loop. Um, and what we found is that this causes a change in the laminar flow profile as it transitions uh, from the, to the wider diameter tubing. And this coupled with um, the auto sampler already cushioning the, bracketing the samples with air actually allowed us to use basically the full range of the sample loop. So uh, on this graph here, we show the linearity uh, from, uh, for the five milliliter loop and the 10 milliliter loop. And we see good linearity throughout the entire range of the um, the loading volume. So at 10, up to 10 milliliters, we find good linearity. Um, however, uh, or I guess this, so this obviously increases your loading capacity, um, you know, able to inject up to five mils on a five milliliter loop or 10 milliliters on a 10 milliliter loop without going up to the, uh, a larger sample loop. Um, this opens up some possibilities for you when you're choosing your uh, injection solvent or dissolution solvent. Uh, you can choose a weaker solvent maybe because uh, you have more volume you can use for a sample and that's going to improve your chromatography and we'll talk about that a little, a little later. Um, because obviously sample recovery is paramount in our PrEP HPLC um, outcomes, uh, we do suggest uh, not filling it more than one milliliter less the loop size. So if I have a five milliliter loop, I would suggest not filling more than four milliliters, uh, just to be sure that, you know, if you have a change in your injection um, deviation from our methods, if you have a change in your viscosity of your injection solvent or uh, something like that, 
you don't lose sample to the uh, waistline. This was uh, done with the auto sampler module. Uh, so that is bracketing the uh, sample with air, which should help uh, increase the linearity, the range of linearity for this. Um, If you're doing manual injection, we still suggest only 50% of the loop size, and that's because you're not cushioning it, cushioning it with air, and then you're also introducing operator variation in the flow, um, the flow rate of the loading. And the final topic I'd like to discuss today is uh, how can uh, the, the sample dissolution solvent we choose affect my prep, chrom prep chromatography? Uh, and to really visualize this, uh, we, we wanted to show you it on the flash side first because we can, can see the colored bands on a flash column um, using an injection with a strong dissolution solvent and a weak dissolution solvent. And so on the left here, we have injected a um, sample, a colored sample, and you can observe the band broadening due to both visually and, the, and in the chromatograph uh, due to injection in the, of the strong dissolution solvent. So uh, this would be a polar, uh, strongly polar solvent here. And when we dissolve it in a weak solvent, um, you can see the band broadening is greatly reduced. And so this makes sense with, uh, you know, what we, we've learned in, uh, you know, general chromatographic methods for flash, uh, you know, what you want to load with uh, your weaker solvent, weakest solvent possible. Um, and so we're going to discuss how we can apply that to the prep side here. But this is to visualize for you guys. You can actually see the band broadening on the column uh, just by changing the, the dissolution solvent. So this, this would also apply to prep. Um, so back to the prep side, um, so we, we, we hear a lot of people that just do injections using just purely DMSO, and we understand sometimes that's the only possible thing um, with some samples because they're just really, really hard to dissolve. Um, but we wanted to showcase um, some alternative methods for you guys that may be helpful uh, for your compounds. So. Considerations for your loading solvent. Uh, ultimately, it's a compromise between good di dissolution, and you want to minimize the effect of the on the integrity of the chromatographic separation. So we don't want um, significant band broadening, um, you know, peak shape um, problems. Um, ideally, when we choose a dissolution solvent, but we are still still need good to decent dis dissolution to do that. Um, So uh, we have an example here. So we, you know, we took this injection here. We have a polar compound. Uh, we needed to we dissolve the sample in DMSO uh, with one milliliter DMSO, and we get a pretty good prep chromatogram from it. Uh, the two pound two compounds separate. We get baseline separation between the two. The peak shape is um, is, is okay. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we're we're meeting our goal of separating out the two compounds um, around the four and a half and six minute mark there, and we get good baseline separation. So for prep, this is great. However, when we increase the uh, concentration um, and the loading volume to 2.5 milliliters, the DMSO starts to significantly contribute to uh, degradation of the integrity of the, the chromatogram um, and the separation. So now we get a lot of peak fronting. Uh, peaks are overlapping. We're not getting baseline separation anymore between the two peaks, and we're probably getting some compound loss uh, out at the DMSO solvent front, which is that first peak around two, uh, two to three minutes. The DMSO plug is probably carrying a significant amount of compound out with it. So we were uh, so. This is actually work done by my um, uh, coworker, uh, Jack Silver, and he uh, was investigating how we can avoid this problem by, you know, maybe using an increased amount of a weak solvent, okay? And so 
we've actually he actually showed that you can increase the loading capacity in a weaker solvent and retain your baseline separation and thus the integrity of the prep separation uh, significantly um, by dissolving in water. So this, these are examples showing that. So what he did is he took the same concentration of sample and DMSO in water, and this is the same uh, sample as before. So he, when he dissolved it in 2.5 milliliters of DMSO, he, he saw degradation of the um, chromatographic integrity, uh, no longer had baseline separation, and basically you couldn't load any more uh, compound onto it. He was able to do it one, at one milliliter, but not 2.5. Uh, when he did this, dissolving it in 2.5 milliliters of water, uh, he was able to retain baseline separation, uh, really good peak shape. It's got a little bit of a shark fin, but with the prep scale and the loading that you're doing, that's that's okay. And then finally, he was able to scale this up, so he's able to double the almost double the amount and inject a four milliliter sample uh, in water and retain baseline separation and get good prep prep separation, which would be great for your prep, prep HPLC. So the reason we presented this is that <clears throat> sometimes we all we, we like to jump to using the most polar solvent, and you know maybe thinking outside the box, maybe the weaker solvent may be a be a an alternative, even though you're loading more of volume wise onto the onto the column. So to summarize what we discussed today, uh, we discussed uh, how to maximize your injection efficiency. Uh, contrasted the benefits of different loading techniques, uh, their benefits and, and disadvantages. Um, we explained several considerations to maximize sample recovery. We established some guidelines for sample loop loading and how, how it contributes to eliminating sample loss. And uh, ultimately, we showed the importance of choosing the best loading solvent and its effect on chromatographic integrity and loading capacity. Um, if you guys have any further questions, you guys can input them into the chat window. Uh, we did get a couple questions from uh, during the uh, during the the talk here, so I'm going to go ahead and try and answer those. Uh, someone asked, uh, "What do you mean by if a small air bubble precedes the small volume?" Um, so the experiments that were done, basically, they injected a 10 microliter uh, air bubble before they injected their sample, uh, so they could they could pull up the air bubble into the syringe, or they uh, injected a bubble before they injected the the volume with the syringe, and so the air bubble basically separates the uh, sample plug from the fluid that's already in the sample loop, um, and that minimizes the effect of the laminar flow profile and eliminates mixing. Um, let's see. Uh, another question regarding this is, is the air going onto the column. Um, so that amount of air on a prep column is pretty insignificant. Um, we've done numerous runs with the same columns using uh, injecting um, using the auto sampler, which actually puts a 50 microliter plug in front of the sample. Um, and there's no problems with the column integrity because of it. Um, so it's, it's really a small amount of the, the air. And some of that air actually gets lost in the valve. Um, I guess depending on the volume, it gets pushed through to the sample uh, waste if you're doing a full injection. Uh, another question um, is how can I calculate the column volume? Um, and so can actually, we have a, I kind of cheat a little bit, I've got a handy little chart uh, next to my uh, um, HPLC unit that gives it gives, gives me that information, but it's going to depend on your particle size um, and the diameter of the column, uh, but that's something we can follow up on and send you some information. So another question um, 
that goes probably with a general uh, general HPLC system is after the injection, what, uh, when can I turn the knob and how fast can I turn the knob, which changes loading position to injection position. Uh, so we use a manual valve when we're investigating um, different aspects of the AccuPrep sometimes. So it's, it's best to turn the knob as fast as possible. <laughs> uh, the, the, the better you can get that valve um, valve turn, the better your um, peak shape is going to be. I've noticed that if you're, have in, if you're doing that slowly, you get peak shape problems. Um, but you want to turn the knob right after you've finished your injection into the sample loop. So once you've loaded your sample loop, load it or uh, and do the turn the injection knob and you're good to go. Um, another question is we end up dissolving the compound in, in DMSO because of poor solubilities of the compounds. Uh, so dissolving in water may not be a solution. Uh, are there any other options other than dissolving in water DMSO? Uh, so that's a great question because you're right, you know, the compounds that Jack was working on, we had some solubility in water. Um, ideally, you know, if you think back to when we, you know, when you learned flash chromatography and organic chemistry, you always wanted to stick towards the, uh, towards, you didn't want to go stronger than your um, starting, starting conditions for your, your column. So. Um, uh, so in this case, if you're using a water, a water, a water acetonitrile method, uh, you know, you can try adding a little bit of acetonitrile um, to the sample, the minimum amount to get that dissolved. Um, or maybe you're, you're doing a water and you can do water and DMSO. Um, you know, add a little bit of water to the DMSO, or sorry, add the DM, a little bit of DMSO to the water um, sample and uh, basically dilute the effect of the DMSO. Uh, so that's one way you can do that. But you can use any solvent that you'd like, but you want to try and stick towards something that's going to be weaker than your initial starting gradient. And another good question is, is uh, what uh, does a sample need to be completely completely dissolved? And that's a good question. Definitely, um, if you're injecting without a guard column or a filter, and this is going to depend on your sample too, how crude it is. Uh, you know, maybe you have a sample that your compound of interest dissolves completely, but you've got some precipitate that doesn't doesn't dissolve. That's where sample prep is probably going to be kind of important, and you might want to filter that off. Uh, but anything that you want to get onto the column should be dissolved. Um, and if you're doing something like that, I suggest the use of a guard column and a filter to uh, prevent any particulate getting onto your column. Uh, and final question here uh, is if the – oh, two questions. Okay, final two questions. Uh, if the sample is dissolved in DMSO H2O, what should the mole phase be, and will it not precipitate hydrophobic samples? Uh, so that's a good question. I think when you, whenever you use DMSO water to dissolve something, you should be able to use, uh, this is assuming that water is your weak solvent in the mobile phase, and that would work okay. Uh, your strong solvents could be acetonitrile or THF or uh, methanol. Um, so any of the traditional mobile phases would work. Um, and you do have, like you said, the question of precipitation for hydrophobic samples. Um, so maybe then, um, you maybe maybe you need to increase your starting gradient um, also to help prevent precipitation. Um, if you have an idea of where your compound's eluding in the uh, separation after maybe doing some scouting runs with smaller volumes and smaller concentrations, then you can do a focus gradient, and that usually will allow you to increase your starting gradient and reduce the risk of precipitation. That's a good question. Um, and the last question here is in, in, in regards to loop size. And so are there any disadvantages using a 10 milliliter loop compared to the smaller 5 milliliter loop on the AccuPrep or EasyPrep? And what is the minimum volume we need to inject when using a 10 milliliter loop? 
So that's a good question. Uh, so as we, you know, the smaller the loop size is going to give you um, less band broadening ultimately, um, especially when we're transitioning from the 1 16th to the 1 8th tubing for 5 milliliter loops and higher. Um, you're going to get a little bit of band broadening inside the sample loop. Um, but you can do one milliliter injections easily with the five mil loop or 10 milliliter, milliliter loop. You know, we were doing 100 microliter injections using the five mil loop with good uh, consistent reproducibility. Um, so the disadvantage of using a 10 mil loop instead of a five mil loop is that you, you might get a little more band broadening, but you do gain the, the greater range of linearity. Um, it really determined, de um, depends on what your minimum injection volumes are uh, for your applications on the limitations between the 5 mil loop and the 10 mil loop. So, but I, I have had success going down to 100 microliters using both, but you do get a little bit of band broadening. So, um, I want to thank you guys for your time today. If you guys have any further questions, you guys can email us. Uh, we'll answer any questions uh, that didn't get answered today. Uh, but you can contact me directly at uh, joshua.lovell at teledyne.com. Um, my direct phone number is there also. Um, but I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me today and hope that we were able to give you guys some advice that can help you with your prep HPLC. So thank you. Uh, further information and follow-up will be sent out to all participants later on this week. We'll give you instructions on how to access both Josh's presentation and the recording of this webinar. Uh, so be on the lookout for that information later on this week. And again, uh, reach out to Josh or your rep at Teledyne if you have any further questions. Thank you.